Right, hi everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Philosophy with Mr. Hands. Um, we're going to be looking at the first section of uh, the first Plato reading that we do for the year, which is the Phaedo. Um, remember, this is uh, from the collection known as The Last Days of Socrates. So it is a dis primarily discussions between Socrates and a whole string of people, um, you know, in the lead up to his trial, uh, and then after his trial as well, which is what we're reading now. Um, so yeah, it's this uh, reading particularly, and the sections that we're doing uh, are to do with the mind-body debate, um, which is what we've been looking at with Descartes and Armstrong so far. Um, what we're going to see is Plato uh, presenting a distinction between the body and the soul um, in this first section, which is known as the argument from affinity. Um, to say an argument, the argument from affinity, what it really just means is the argument based on what the two things are like. Um, so they have an affinity towards something. They are like something. Um, so what Plato's going to point out is that the soul is uh, unchanging, immortal, and perfect, whereas the body is the total opposite of that. And that therefore these two things must be very different. He's then going to move on to talking about... Um, kind of the attributes of the soul uh, and talking about how the soul can be corrupted by the um, the physical world, the corporeal world, um, and why doing philosophy is so important, which obviously I agree with, <laughs> uh, because it keeps our soul prepared. Um, prepared for what? Prepared for returning to the world of being, uh, the world of perfect forms and perfect ideas. So, um, this first video will probably be the longest one of the Plato, uh, or the Phaedo, um, recordings at least, so, uh, it might go on for a little while, but, um, we'll get through this first section, the argument from affinity, um, all in one go. So, pens at the ready, uh, and, um, I'll be starting from, well, the very first page, um, in your reader book for Phaedo, uh, and it's the italicized part at the bottom of the, um, page, the argument from affinity is the first part. So here we go. The argument from affinity, the unseen soul, particularly when it avoids the company of the body, is more like the unchanging and indestructible ideas than the visible, changing, perishable entities we are familiar with. So uh, we've got here the separation. Uh, this is just a little summary of what's to come in this section of the reading, uh, which you see in Plato's text. It makes it very easy for you to understand what's what's about to continue well, what's going to come after it um, so we're going to see this separation between the soul and the body um, according to the ep um, epistemo uh, epistemology there we go of the Mino to which the Phaedo is in general closely related this is another um, platonic text that they're talking about uh, one cannot hope to know what sort a thing is until one has discovered what it is. Here Socrates argues from one property of the soul to another, but not from what it actually is. He will later be able to show the lack of total conviction which flows from this kind of argument, and discuss more fully what the soul is in the course of his reply to the doubts that still linger. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to see Socrates, or, you know, remember Socrates is sort of the mouthpiece of Plato in the texts, um, presenting the idea that the soul and the body must be two separate things, and him sort of developing that a little bit more. So here we go into the dialogue. We ought, I think, said Socrates, to ask ourselves this. What sort of thing is it that would naturally suffer the fate of being dispersed? Um, so by dispersed we mean broken apart. What sort of thing should we be afraid of this happening to, and what's, what should we not? When we have answered this, we should next consider to which class the soul belongs, and then we'll sh we shall know whether to feel confidence or fear about the fate of our souls. Quite true. Um, you'll see that uh, the person that Socrates uh, is having his conversation with in a lot of Plato's texts um, doesn't do a whole lot more than agree or, you know, uh, provide Socrates with the answer that he needs just to continue rabbiting on. Um, the second text that we do, the Gorgias, we'll see the person he's discussing uh, things with Callicles put up a little bit more of a fight, but um, pretty much in the reading we're doing for Phaedo, we'll just get these sorts of little, quite true, and that must be correct, Socrates, and those sorts of little additions. Uh, anyway, continuing on. Would you not expect a compound or a naturally composite object to be liable to break up where it was put together? 
and ought not anything which is really in composite to be the one thing of all others which is not affected in this way. That seems to be the case, said Sebes. So um, what Plato's pointing out here is just the sort of common sense idea of, well, it makes wouldn't it make more sense if things are put together from separate items and you break them? They'll probably break along the fracture lines where you put them together. Think of dropping a jigsaw puzzle. You're not going to snap the pieces. What you're going to do is the jigsaw puzzle is going to come apart at where the, the points where the people pieces were put together. Um, so he's saying, you know, that if something is composite, it's made up of several things, it will break easily. If it's incomposite, it won't. Uh, it is not extreme. Uh, is it not extremely po uh, probable that what is always constant and, in and invariable is incomposite, and what is inconstant and variable is composite? So in other words, what stays the same must be one thing, what changes a lot must be composite, must be made of lots of different things. That is how it seems to me. Discussing, uh, sorry, uh, then let us return to the same examples which we were discussing before. Does that actual nature, does that actual nature of things, their true being which we try to describe in our discussions, remain always constant and invariable or not? Does equality itself or beauty itself or any other thing as uh, it is in itself ever admit change of any kind? Or does each one of these entities, being uniform and self-contained, remain always constant and invariable, never admitting any alteration in any respect or in any sense? They must be constant and invariable, Socrates, said Sebes. So when he's talking about equality and beauty, um, he's clearly referencing the world of the forms here, the, the world of being. Uh, where perfect ideas for things um, exist. Being perfect, they are not composite. They're not made up of lots of things. They are entities unto themselves. And so, yeah, th this is a clear reference to the world of being here. Um, well, what about the many instances of beauty, such as men, horses, clothes, and so on, or of equality, or any other things which have the same name as those others? Are they constant? Or are they, on the contrary, scarcely ever in the same relation in any sense, either to themselves or to one another? You're right again about them, Socrates. They are never free from variation. So if we think about the concept of beauty, uh, what Socrates is saying here is we have the form of beauty, the perfect idea. This is constant, um, perfect, not composite. But then if we think of what we consider beautiful here in this physical world, well, lots of things, and sometimes opposing things. Um, you know, uh, even if we think of people, I mean, some people find certain people very attractive and other people find that same person very unattractive uh, or beautiful and not beautiful. Why do we get such variation here? Well, because we live in this composite, imperfect world. So this is the world of becoming, the one that we live in, the physical world. Um, that, that, that they're sort of drawing a link to. When, they, when he says, what about the many instances of beauty? He's talking about what about when we experience beauty here in the world of becoming, uh, and it's imperfect. Um, and these later things, uh, or latter things rather, uh, you can touch and see or perceive by your other senses, but those constant entities you cannot possibly apprehend except by the workings of the mind. Such things are invisible to our sight. Um, so, uh, here he's pointing out that beauty is something that you can't see, taste, touch, smell, or hear, um, as in the concept of it. It can only be uh, understood by the mind. The instances of it you can experience, but those are imperfect and changing. Uh, that is perfectly true, said Sebes. So you think that we should assume two classes of things that may be such and such, one visible and the other invisible. Yes, we should. The visible being, uh, sorry, the invisible being invariable or never changing, and the visible never being the same. Yes, let's assume that too. Well now, said Socrates, are we not part body, part soul? Certainly. So Socrates is just asserting that we are, um, you know, he's asserting a dualist argument here and getting no fight from Phaedo. Uh, sorry, from um, Sebes. Uh, um, so certainly, then to which class do we say that the body would have the closest or the closer resemblance and relation? That's obvious to anybody. 
the to the visible. And the soul, is it invisible, uh, visible or invisible? Invisible to men, at any rate, Socrates, he said. So Sebes is sort of saying, well, the gods might see it, but, you know, invisible to men. So he's sort of saying, well, yep, Socrates, invisible to us, at least. Uh, but surely we have been speaking of things visible or invisible to our human nature. Do you think that we had some other nature in view? No, human nature. So Socrates sees the little game he's playing and he says, well, you know, let's stick to the parameters of the discussion we've been having. Um, what do we say about the soul then? Is it visible or invisible? Not visible. Invisible then. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so soul is more like the invisible and body more like the visible. Inevitably, Socrates. Now, we're sort of cut off a little bit by the binding, um, and I don't have the actual text here. Uh, so, um, we'll skip over. He's, so, turn the page. We'll talk about that line a little bit later on. But um, uh, So, going from the next page. So, in instrumentality of the body for any inquiry, whether through sight or hearing or any other sense, because using the body means using the senses. It is drawn away by the body into the realm of the variable and loses its way and becomes confused and dizzy as though it were tipsy through contact with that kind of thing. So what he's talking about here is um, the soul, what happens to the soul when it gets uh, attached to a body. Um, or And so we see here um, when the soul is forced to enter this physical body and it's forced to use the senses to try and reach conclusions it ends up being confused and dizzy uh, as though it were tipsy um, and so yeah continuing on certainly uh, but when it investigates by itself it passes into the realm of the pure and everlasting and deathless and changeless and being of a kindred nature when it is uh, once independent and free from interference consorts with it always and stays no longer, but remains constant and invariable when busied with them, uh, through contact with things of a similar nature, and this condition of the soul we call wisdom. An excellent description and perfectly true, Socrates. So what we've gotten from these two paragraphs is when the soul, or the mind if we want to call it that, is forced to deal with things from the corporeal world, the physical world, so it's, it's forced to use senses, are the five senses to try and come to truth. It gets confused and, you know, because things are always changing and it doesn't make sense, it gets confused easily. But when we allow our soul or our mind just to focus on perfect concepts, then it sort of is able to transcend this. It loses this dizziness, this like drunk-like state, and it's able to think much more clearly. Um, as we see at the end there, this is what we call wisdom, according to Socrates. Very well then, in the light of all that we have said, both now and before, to which class do you think that the soul bears the closest resemblance and relation? I think, Socrates, said Sebes, that even the most slow-witted person, approaching the subject in this way, would agree that the soul is in every possible way more like the invariable than the variable, and the body like the other. Uh, look at it in this way too. When soul and body share the same place, Natural, uh, sorry, nature teaches the one to serve and be subject to the other, uh, subject the other to rule and govern. In this relation, which do you think resembles the divine, and which is like uh, what's mortal? Don't you think that it is the nature of the divine to rule and direct, and that of the mortal to be subject and serve? I do. Then which does the soul, the soul resemble? Obviously, Socrates. Uh, soul resembles the divine and body the mortal. Uh, now, um, just to pause for a moment here, uh, later on in the reading we're going to get a, a link back to this argument, this argument that the soul is essentially the driver of the body, that the soul acts on the body, not the other way around. Um, so I just want to stop for a moment and, and sort of make that clear. This idea of like the driver um, soul, the... Um, the soul being the master of the body and kind of pointing it in whatever direction it wants is an important one uh, because it's going to come up again later. Uh, so the soul controls the body, not the other way around. Now, Sebes, he said, uh, see whether, uh, whether this is our conclusion from all that we have said. 
The soul is most like that which is divine, immortal, intelligible, uniform, in, indissoluble, and ever self-consistent and invariable, whereas body is most like that which is human, mortal, multiform, unintelligible. It, that's not unintelligent, it's unintelligible. We can't ever know it because it's always changing. Uh, dissoluble and never self-consistent. Can we adduce uh, any conflicting argument, my dear Sebis, to show that this is not so? No, we cannot. Very well then. In that case, is it not natural for body to uh, disintegrate rapidly, but for soul to be quite, uh, um, quite or very nearly indissoluble? Uh, certainly. Of course you know that when a person dies, although it is natural for the visible and physical part of him, which lies here in the visible world, and which we call his corpse, to decay and fall to pieces and be dissipated, none of this happens to it immediately. It remains as it was for quite some time, particularly so if death takes place where the body is in attractive condition, and the weather is also fine. Indeed, when the body is dried and embalmed, as in Egypt, it remains almost intact for an incredible time, and even if the rest of the body decays, some parts of it, the bones and sinews and anything else like them, are practically everlasting. Uh, uh, that is so, is it not? Yes. So he's talking about the body at death here. Generally speaking, it's going to decay. Can we do things to keep it, you know, relatively as it was? Um, yeah, we can, but, you know, some form of decay is probably still going to occur. Uh, but the soul, uh, the invisible part, which goes away to a place uh, that is, like itself, glorious, pure, and invisible, the true Hades or unseen world, into the presence of the good and wise God, where, if God so wills, my soul must surely go. Uh, will it, if its very nature is such as I have described, be blown to bits and destroyed at the moment of its release from the body, as most people claim? Far from it, my dear uh, Simeus and Sebes. So what he's saying here, the soul at death is very different to the soul, uh, the body at death. Um, the body is going to break down. It's going to decay. Uh, even with attempts to try and stop that, we can't ever stop it totally. The soul is not going to decay. It's not going to, you know, as he talks about, uh, it's not going to be blown away to bits. Um, we'll continue on. Uh, so reflections after the similarity argument concerning the fate of those souls which have and which have not separated themselves from bodily concerns. The truth is much more like this. If at its release the soul is pure and does not drag along with it any trace of the body because it has never willingly associated with it in, uh, in life, if it has shunned it and isolated itself because that is what it always practices, I mean doing philosophy in the right way and really getting used to facing death calmly, wouldn't you call this practicing death? So here Socrates is talking about why he does philosophy, and remember in the context of what we're studying, why he's not scared to die, um, because he's been practicing death, and from his perspective that is what doing philosophy is, it is preparing ourselves for death. Um, the big part of that is making sure that our soul never willingly wants to be part of the body. It's sort of a friendship that, uh, or a partnership that we, our soul gets forced into and our soul makes the best of it, but it never really wants to be there. Um, so most decidedly, very well, if this is its condition, then it departs to the place where things are like itself. Invisible, divine, immortal, and wise, where on its arrival happiness awaits it, and release from un uncertainty and folly from fears and gnawing desires and all other human evils, and where, as they say of the initiates in the mysteries, it really spreads, ah, uh, sorry, uh, spends rather, the rest of time with divine beings. Shall we adopt this view, Sebes, or some other? This one by all means, Sebes. So Socrates here is basically saying what happens to the soul um, in the afterlife. It is able to detach itself from the body, finally. Um, break free from this thing that holds it in place and stops it from doing things the way that it wants it to be done, um, and it's able to transcend it. It you know achieves a state of happiness, um, and it gets initiated into the mysteries. Remember, this is really the world of the forms, the world of being. So the soul is able to finally escape this world of becoming that it's trapped in because of being associated with the body, 
and enter the world of being. Uh, but I suppose if, at the time of its release, the soul is tainted and impure, because it has always associated with the body and cared for it and loved it, and has been so beguiled by the body and its passions and pleasures that nothing seems real to it but those physical things which can be touched and seen and eaten and drunk and used for sexual enjoyment, making it accustomed to hate and fear and avoid what is invisible and obscure to our eyes, but intelligible and comprehensible by philosophy, if the soul is in this state, do you think that it will be released just by itself, uncontaminated? Not in the least, he said. So what Socrates is doing here is describing a decadent person, um, someone who is obsessed with this physical world we live in. Um, you know, they always are eating, you know, they want nice foods and nice drink. They want the best clothes. You know, they're interested in um, getting drunk and having sex and um, really every physical pleasure that you can imagine. Um, what they're doing, they're training their soul to become reliant on the body. Uh, and when it's time for the soul to detach, um, Socrates is saying what's going to happen is the soul won't get a clean break. Essentially, this perfect soul that has been attached to this body is going to end up being contaminated by that body. Um, so, continuing, on the contrary, it will, I imagine, be permanent, uh, sorry, permeated by the corporeal, which fellowship and intercourse with the body will have ingrained in its very nature through constant association and long practice. Certainly, in other words, the soul's gotten used to being in this physical world and now doesn't want to leave. And we must suppose, my dear fellow, that the corporeal is heavy, oppressive, earthly and visible. So the soul which is tainted by its presence is weighed down and dragged back into the visible world through fear, as they say, of Hades or the invisible, and hovers about tombs and graveyards. The shadowy apparitions which have actually been seen there are the ghosts of those souls which have not got clear away but still retain some portion of the visible, which is why they can be seen. Um, now, I think in class I've made it perfectly clear how I feel about ghosts and people who see them, um, but or believe in them rather. Um, but here we've got Socrates making an argument for why we have ghosts and why ghosts are most commonly seen in graveyards and things like that. These are souls that were so poorly prepared for death that uh, they simply could not separate themselves from the physical body. And when the physical body was buried, well, the soul just hung around where the physical body was buried. Um, it's the type of thing that you read sometimes in philosophy and you're like, oh my God, that's why we see ghosts at graveyards. But let's go back a step and just ask ourselves whether ghosts really exist and whether we have any evidence at all of them. Uh, yeah, thanks, Plato. Uh, that seems likely enough, Socrates. Thanks, Sebi. Yep, yep. Uh, you're really pulling your weight. Uh, yes, it does, Sebi's. Of course, uh, these are not the souls of the good, but of inferior people, and they are compelled to wander about these places as a punishment for their bad conduct in the past. They continue wandering until at last, through craving for the corporeal, which unceasingly pursues them, they are imprisoned once more in a body. And as you might expect, they are attached to the same sort of character or nature which they have developed during life. Uh, what sort do you mean, Socrates? Um, so he's talking about here where this, these souls, these ghosts that are wandering around and don't want to go to Hades, don't want to go on to the next perfect world, um, will eventually be connected to a body again. They'll be latched to another body. Uh, so what sort do you mean, Socrates? Well, those who have cultivated gluttony or assault or drunkenness, instead of taking pains to avoid them, are likely to assume the form of donkeys and other perverse animals. Don't you think so? Yes, that is very likely. So here's a good reason not to eat to excess or hurt other people or get drunk, kids. Um, Plato saying that uh, your soul at the point of death will not detach cleanly and go into Hades. Instead, it's probably going to be latched to a donkey or some other perverse an animal. I'm not sure what other perverse animals there are, but yeah. Uh, and those who have deliberately preferred a life of injustice, suppression, and robbery with violence become wolves and hawks and kites, unless we can suggest any other more likely animal. Uh, no, the ones which you mentioned are exactly right. 
So if you break the law, uh, if you suppress other people, if you rob and uh, particularly rob with violence, then you'll be reincarnated as a wolf and a hawk and a kite. A kite is a type of bird, by the way. Um, so on the surface, this doesn't sound too bad. Wolves are pretty cool. But um, Socrates is obviously meaning this is a bad thing because uh, obviously our soul would rather go on to the world of being. Uh, so it is easy to imagine into what sort of animal all the other kinds of souls will go in accordance with their con uh, conduct during life. Yes, certainly. I suppose that the happiest people and those who reach the best destination are the ones who have cultivated the goodness of an ordinary citizen, so-called temperance or self-control, uh, and justice, which is acquired by habit and practice uh, without the help of philosophy and reason. How are these the happiest? Uh, or how are these the happiest? Because they will probably pass into some other kind of social and disciplined creature, like bees, wasps, and ants, or even back into the human race again, becoming decent citizens. Very likely. So just to go back for a moment, good people, um, funnily enough, may not make it to the afterlife, because their, their soul may still not be quite prepared to go but they're probably going to be attached to a better form of animal. So we've identified temperance, justice, uh, as you know, these are good things to have in a citizen. Um, these are, are good qualities. And the soul that has these is likely to be connected to animals like bees, wasps, and ants, so social creatures. Um, or perhaps even uh, be attached to a human again. Um, and then hence um, kind of going full circle and becoming a decent citizen once again. Uh, so very likely. But no soul which has not practiced philosophy and is not absolutely pure when it leaves the body may attain to the divine nature. That is only for the lover of learning. This is the reason, my dear Simeus and Sebes, why true philosophers abstain from all bodily desires and withstand them and do not yield to them. Remember this next time you're at a party, everyone. The true philosopher doesn't take part in that sort of frivolity because we must keep our souls pure and ready to ascend to the next life. Um, it is not because they are afraid of financial uh, loss or poverty like the average man who thinks of money first, nor because they uh, shrink from dishonor and a bad reputation like lovers of prestige and authority. No, those would be unworthy motives, Socrates, said Sebes. They would indeed, he agreed. And so, Sebes, those who care about their souls and do not devote themselves to the body disassociate themselves firmly from these others and refuse to accompany them on their haphazard journey. They believe that it is wrong to oppose philosophy with her offer of liberation and purification. So they turn and follow her wherever she leads. What do you mean, Socrates? So in other words, anyone who really wants to get you know, to a good afterlife needs to be doing philosophy and, and follow her wherever she leads. I will explain, he said. Every seeker after wisdom, or philosopher, knows that up to the time when philosophy takes it uh, over, his soul is a helpless prisoner, chained hand and foot in the body, compelled to view reality not directly, but only through its prison bars, and wallowing in utter ignorance. This is a tip of the hat to um, the cave, the, the allegory of the cave, where Plato suggests that we are prisoners and we don't experience reality, we experience these shadow, shadowy reflections. The desire of all philosophers is to escape the cave, and so he's presenting that here. And philosophy can see the ingenuity of the imprisonment which is brought about by the prisoner's own active desire, which makes him first accessory to his own confinement. Uh, in other words, most people just want to stay in the cave. Uh, well, philosophy takes over the soul in this condition and by gentle persuasion tries to set it free. She points out that observation by means of the eyes and ears and all other senses abounds with deception. So, in other words, we can't trust the senses because all it gives us is these shadowy reflections. And she urges the soul to refrain from using them unless it is necessary to do so and encourages it to collect and concentrate itself in isolation, trusting nothing but its own isolated judgment upon realities considered in isolation and attributing no truth to any other thing which it views through another medium in some 
uh, in some other thing. Such objects she knows are sensible and visible, but what she herself sees is intelligible and invisible. So what uh, Socrates and Plato are talking about here is a separation between two different forms of knowledge. Um, in philosophy, we call this a priori and a posteriori. So a priori knowledge is knowledge that is gained through reason alone. In other words, through the activity of your mind. You can reach a priori, a priori knowledge just by thinking about it. And a great example of this is mathematics. All mathematics is an example of a priori knowledge. Because, you know, if you think of geometry, well, perfect shapes don't exist. So how do we understand how to measure perfect, perfect shapes? Um, it is through our thinking alone, our reasoning. As, in other words, a priori. A posteriori is knowledge gained through the senses. So a good example of this is really any science subject. How do we know about, you know, the biological composition of our body? Well, we looked and there was evidence. We used our senses and that gave us the answer. So it's knowledge gained through the senses. What Socrates is saying here is that the soul craves a priori knowledge, knowledge through reasoning alone, and it shuns a posteriori knowledge, knowledge gained through the senses. Um, and so it only wants things that are intelligible or certain, which a priori knowledge is said to be, um, yet invisible, something that can't be seen with the senses. Um, continuing on, now the soul of the true philosopher feels that it must not reject this opportunity for release, and so it abstains as far as possible from pleasures and desires and griefs, because it reflects that the result of giving way to pleasure, fear, pain or desire is not, as might be supposed, the trivial misfortune of becoming ill or wasting money through self-indulgence, but the last and worst calamity of all, which the sufferer does not take into account. What is that, Socrates? asked Sebes. While anyone's soul feels a keen pleasure or, uh, or pain, uh, it cannot help supposing that whatever causes the most violent emotion is the plainest and truest reality, which it is not. It is chiefly visible things that have this effect, isn't it? Quite so. It is not on this sort of occasion that the soul passes, sorry, is it not on this sort of occasion that uh, the soul passes most completely into the bondage of the body? Uh, how is that? Because every pleasure or pain has a sort of rivet with which it fastens the soul to the body and pins it down and makes it corporeal or physical, accepting as true whatever the body certifies. The result of agreeing with the body and finding pleasure in the same things uh, is, I imagine, that it cannot help coming to share its character and its diet, so that it can never get clean away to the unseen world, but is always saturated with the body uh, when it sets out and so soon falls back again into another body where it takes root and grows. Consequently, it has no share of fellowship with the pure and uniform and divine. So this, sorry, I sort of read a, a, quite a large section there, but um, what he's talking about is the idea of, well, if we begin to fear or crave things in the physical world, then we're what we're doing is we're training our soul to fear or crave the same things. So obviously Socrates is going to link this to being scared of death, um, but death is the death of the physical body. So we're really being, we're afraid of something that's going to occur in the physical world. We want to train our soul so that we don't fear things in the physical world so that we can stay separated from them. Um, so uh, that's kind of what he's talking about here. And the more that we allow ourselves to crave physical things or to fear physical things, the more we are attaching our soul to our body. Um, we want to uh, crave nothing and fear nothing in this physical world. That is the sign of a soul that is ready to transcend to the world of being. Um, uh, so, yes, that is perfectly true, Socrates, said Sebes. Uh, it is for these reasons, Sebes, that true philosophers exhibit self-control and courage, not for the reasons that most people do, or do you think it's for the same reason? No, certainly not. No, indeed. A philosopher's soul will take the view which I have described. It will not uh, first expect to be set free by philosophy and then allow pleasure and pain to reduce it once more to bondage, thus condemning itself to an endless task, like Penelope, 
um, this connecting to a Greek myth, not important, uh, when she worked um, to undo her own weaving. No, this soul brings calm to the seas of desire uh, by following reason and abiding always in her company and by contemplating the true and divine and unambiguous, in other words, by trying to focus on the forms and drawing inspiration from it because such a soul believes that this is the right way to live while life endures and that after death it reaches a place which is kindred and similar to its own nature and there is rid forever of human ills. So just pause for a moment here. Um, if we allow our soul to do what our soul is there to do, um, then this bring, as you know, Socrates says, brings calm to the sea of desires. In other words, um, it allows us to fully uh, separate ourselves from our body and the demands of this physical world. Um, and you know, as he points out towards the end there, rid, rid ourselves forever of human ills. Uh, in other words, physical ills. After such a training, my dear Simeus and Sebes, the soul can have no grounds for fearing that uh, on its separation from the body it will be blown away and scattered by the winds and so disappear into thin air and cease to exist altogether. So, in other words, Socrates is essentially saying, well, I've done philosophy and I've done philosophy for a really long time and I've dedicated myself to it. I've trained my soul to be ready for the separation from the body and it will not fear being separated from the body at all. It will not crave to come back to the body. Um, in other words, Socrates is saying, I'm ready for death. So this is the argument from affinity. Remember, it really comes down to the idea that the mind and the uh, body or the soul and the body are two separate things because they are different, as in they are, you know, what they are like is total opposite. Divisible, indivisible, perfect, imperfect, um, everlasting or eternal, and, you know, uh, temporary. Okay, so hopefully it's been clear. I know it's a long video, um, but I wanted to get that first argument all in one video. Uh, if you've got any questions, let me know, uh, either via email or in class. Don't forget to subscribe so that you can get the rest of the videos for Plato's Phaedo and all the other readings. I hope you have a good day, and I'll see you in class.